Greetings to everyone and a very warm welcome to the highly acclaimed and distinguished guest lecture series 2022, an initiative by Technovanza VJTI. This is Shweta Sonavne and I am thrilled to be your host for today. VJTI was established in the year 1887 and it is upholding its proud legacy of over a century filled with the brilliance and educational prowess. It has thrived in nurturing the brightest minds of the society. Technovanza has always been the prime platform where the flame of expertise has been meritoriously passed on to light more torches. The renowned series of guest lectures over the years has added immense values to the young inquisitive minds. Pioneers of diverse fields, including late Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam, Mr. Narayan Murthy, Mr. Ratan Tata, Dr. R. Chidambaram, Nobel Laureate Professor William Phillips, Air Chief Marshal Birendra Singh Dhanwa, Dr. S. Somnath, and many others have added a cherry to the glory of Technovanza. While progressively illuminating young minds to the new areas of interest. Behold, because today, with a sheer delight, we are exhilarated to add a truly inspirational name to our glorious list of dignitaries. Our guest for today is an outstanding scientist and Director General at Brahmo's Aerospace Defense Research and Development Organization. Today, we are pleased to welcome Sri Atul Rani. graduate degree in electronics and communication engineering from Gindi Engineering College, Chennai, and a postgraduate degree in guided missile from the University of Pune. So joined the RDO around 35 years back in 1987, when he was the member of guided missile faculty. In 1998, he was designated as the program manager of avionics and system integration for DRDO's share of the work of the BrahMos joint venture with Russia. He was also deputed to the Embassy of India, Moscow, as Council of Defense Technology in 2010. In October 2013, Sri Atul Rane was appointed as the Director of System Analysis and Modeling Center at the DRDO HQ. He took charge as the Director of International Cooperation DRDO in October 2015. In addition to this, he is the member of the System Society of India, Computer Society of India, Astronautical Society of India, and Society for Aerospace Quality and Reliability. There is so much more to add to your name, sir, and this small introduction would undo enough justice to your numerous accomplishments. The impact that you created on the next generation is the very result of your perseverance and simplicity. We are truly honored to have you as our guest. We also have with us here today the Dean of Student Activities and Alumni, Professor Rohin Daruwala, and the Dean of RDC, Professor Farooq Kazi. Now I request Professor Rohin Daruwala, sir, to please felicitate our guest. regarding our part to be a change and self-reflect under the guidance of clearly the best. Sir, passing it on to you now. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, it's uh, 
always a pleasure to be with the youngsters. I sometimes feel that I'm still a youngster, but it was long ago when I finished my engineering. But it's nice to see that there are still people interested in looking at uh, technology in terms of uh, the government and what we do. Uh, VJTI holds a very special place for me. Of course, uh, your vision is to create global leaders in technology. Well, uh, you have created people like Shekhar Basu, Dr. Anil Kapoorkar, people I have met and worked with. But then you have also had the first woman civil engineer from VJTI. But uh, the secret I want to tell you is why I immediately uh, accepted coming here to VJTI was that my father studied here. He passed out of electrical engineering in 1957 from VJTI. So for me, it's a very emotional time to be in front of you. Anyway, uh, I'm going to touch on a little bit of history, go through a few parts of uh, how DRDO has gone forward in uh, the missile technology. We, we are now self-reliant in missiles to tell you frankly, uh, but uh, there are always uh, uh, a few things which will come up as we start discussing. Uh, there are always a few pitfalls, roadblocks as we move forward in uh, missile development and uh, research. Uh, it, it, it looks like, you know, I'll be going through a, a story, but uh, unluckily I can't see the slide. My, okay, I have the slides here. Uh, ever since humans first saw birds flying, uh, they had a desire to fly. The ancient Greeks and uh, Romans pictured their gods with winged feet. Uh, and they imagined uh, those mythical winged animals like the uh, unicorns, which has a different connotation in today's world. Uh, Acharya Bharadwaj, uh, uh, who was an ardent apostle of uh, Ayurveda and mechanical sciences, he wrote a book called Yantra Sarvaswa, which had a few very interesting and astonishing statements on uh, science, flying machines, and uh, aviation. Uh, but uh, since we are going to stay on rockets and missiles, we will go to that side. And uh, the first military use of a, a rocket was recorded by China sometime in 1232, uh, where they used these flying fire lances against the invading Mongols on their capital. Uh, in those days, the capital was called Kaifeng. It's an ancient capital of uh, China. Uh, warfare has been, uh, you know, at the forefront of civilization. Because the moment you say there is civilization, any of the oldest activities of civilization is confrontation and warfare. It's automatic. Conflict is uh, inherent in human beings. Uh, the race on the battlefield has always been who can be better and how can I have an advantage over the enemy. This led to uh, the f fighters, the users or the warriors themselves donning the mantle of uh, researchers and uh, created uh, uh, different items, I mean, as a, a timeline now, as the evolution of warfare. Uh, but uh, uh, I we like to always uh, use this one particular example when the French and the British were fighting over the uh, riches of India, uh, they frequently engaged with a, a young gentleman called uh, Tipu Sultan of Mysore. And in 1792 and 1799, he used uh, rockets. And these are, uh, they were uh, used fairly well. And we have one of these, uh, no, we don't have, but uh, the uh, Brits always have taken away all our treasures. Uh, there is one of these rockets displayed in the Royal Ordnance Museum of uh, Woolwich Arsenal. Uh, that's where they have their uh, artillery training school. <coughs> we've been there and uh, we've made a copy of it and I have a copy of this particular one in uh, Brahmos Aerospace in Delhi. Uh, people are always welcome to come over to our office in Delhi, our headquarters. We have a wonderful museum also talking about almost the same things which I'm talking about here. Uh, profiting from the experience which the Britishers had, uh, Sir William Congreve took back this idea to uh, UK and uh, created the Congreve rocket, uh, which increased the range to uh, 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 about 150 meters to about 4 kilometers. And uh, he used the, these rockets were used against Napoleon in the Napoleonic Wars. And then uh, the Brits, uh, the British Army's army created an R rocket regiment in uh, 1818. So that was the start of, you know, really uh, 
uh, use of rocket warfare in, uh, in, a, in a systematic way. Now, when you go to rockets as uh, inventions, uh, there are, you know, what they call the fathers of rocketry. I mean, uh, see, the word fathers of rocketry comes when people were not gender specific in those days. So, uh, we would say that they are the leaders of uh, rocketry. Uh, they, they, they come from a, uh, you know, uh, an era when it was still, uh, it was still an evolving science. Uh, a Russian, uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, uh, he published what was known, what is now known as the rocket equation. When he published it, it was a, a part of conservation of momentum, but later on it was called the rocket equation. This was way back in 1903. Uh, Robert Goddard, an American uh, physicist, he uh, launched the first liquid-fueled rocket in uh, Massachusetts in 1926. Uh, Herman Oberth. He's one of the founders of rocketry who lived to see actual space exploration. Uh, he was born in Romania but later moved to Germany, worked for the Nazi Germanys, created the V2 rocket. About 95 of his inventions and his patents, if they were patents in those days, were used in the V2 rocket, which was, uh, uh, I mean, all of us know what it did in the uh, World War II. Uh, then came the uh, Cold War, the Space Age, the race to space between the Soviet Union and the US. Uh, several uh, German, because the V2 rocket, you know, it, it fueled the space uh, race. Uh, several German and uh, I would say Nazi rocket scientists moved either to the US or to the Soviet Union and they assisted both these countries in the 1960s. Uh, both of them contested vociferously, fiercely to demonstrate technological and military superiority over each other. One of the most famous and most written about uh, in all these places is uh, uh, Werner von Braun, who actually also worked on the V2 rockets, but uh, he became more famous for leading the US into the design of the Saturn V rocket, which actually lifted uh, people to the moon. The Apollo, Apollo series of rockets and uh, later on Armstrong on Apollo 11 and uh, on those things. <coughs> The space race was very interesting and it's a very uh, important step in our uh, lives. The industrial revolution, we lost out on. India lost out on. US, UK, France and all those countries, they, they, they were part of the industrial revolution. So that's how they could move into the space age. Uh, 1960s was a time when India was still growing and we were, you know, we were just coming out uh, as uh, free people and trying to think. And that's when Dr. Sarabhai started the rocket party. Right? I am now not going to go on to the rocket side, I will go on to the missile side. Uh, but uh, I would like to make a special mention of uh, uh, Sergei Pavlovich Korolev. Now, uh, you might notice that uh, I, I, I have a lot of uh, a soft corner for the Russians. That's because I work with the Russians. So. <laughs> uh, Sergei Pavlovich uh, Korolev was a leading ro Soviet uh, rocket designer. Uh, he actually pushed the uh, Soviets into space first. He was the designer of the Sputnik uh, uh, satellite. He was the designer of the uh, R-7 rocket, the Belka, the Stelka. These are all the uh, rockets which Russia kept moving. And what the US were scared of, that they're moving and they're reaching first. And then Kennedy said, I want to reach the moon first. And that's how, uh, it, that, that, that was how that space race finished. But uh, uh, coming closer to home, uh, DRDO is what I am a part of. I have always been uh, uh, with DRDO since I left my engineering. Uh, I will have to open the right transmission because I seem to have mixed up a few things here. Yeah. So uh, we also have a vision that is to empower the defense forces with cutting edge technology. I won't go to the other part of it. But uh, we, India, is one of the four countries in the world who have anti-satellite capabilities. Uh, a lot of people argue on whether it's worth having it or not, but it proves that we are capable on our own. Uh, we are one of the six countries uh, who have a multi-pronged uh, strategic uh, capability, a whole triad in fact. Uh, we have our own early warning uh, control systems. We are one of the seven nations with our own fighter aircraft. 
Uh, we are the first country with a supersonic cruise missile triad, that's BrahMos. Uh, this is the first country in the world which has a supersonic cruise missile triad, the same missile on all the three forces, with all the three forces. Uh, we have our, uh, uh, what do you call it, air defense program, we are one of the six or seven countries who have a defense program, and one of the seven countries who have made our own uh, tanks. Now why I'm saying this is, we are there, and uh, we are on the top of the world in terms of defense technologies, but we may not be, is not very well talked about, but the hand behind all of this is DRDO. DRDO has designed all of these things which we were talking about. DRDO is uh, that way not a very large organization, uh, 53 laboratories, about uh, 7,300, 7,500 scientists, and uh, with a, a support group of technical people of about another 9,500 and a few uh, admin allied people. We have split ourselves into a few clusters. We call them technology clusters so that we work in those verticals. Each cluster has a, a director general in charge. We have a few certifying agencies. We, of course, have a, a massive HR behind us to help us in the recruitment and the uh, continuous assessment of scientists. Uh, BrahMos is part of DRDO. Uh, I'll come to what how BrahMos is connected to DRDO or why a DRDO person is in charge of BrahMos. We'll come to that. And then we have now, uh, last year, two years back, we have started what is known as the Young Scientist Labs. These are uh, five laboratories created where the oldest person is 35 years old. The moment they go past 35, he's pulled out of that lab and will be brought back into the mainstream labs. But the idea was to make sure that the youngsters also have a way to grow without the pressure of uh, a senior saying, no, what you're doing is wrong. Make your mistakes. And then you learn, and you can move forward into the mainstream uh, r and I'll be talking about that also a little bit afterwards. Uh, of course, what DRDO did is in uh, 1983, the Integrated Guided Missile Development Program was created uh, with Dr. Kalam as the uh, uh, in charge of the IGMDP. He was uh, he was originally a DRDO man who pushed over into ESLO, worked on the SLV system there satellite launch vehicle and then came back to DRDO in charge of the IGMDP. IGMDP was uh, five missiles which were decided. One is a technology demonstrator which was Agni and there are a few other missiles. Uh, this is, you know, uh, idea was that all the DRDO labs have to work together. It's not just one lab. Today, of course, when you saw the last picture, there's a missile cluster which is separate <coughs> and we have branched out into other areas. But what is this missile cluster done? They have created a bouquet of uh, missiles. Uh, the various versions of Agni, the various versions of uh, Prithvi, the Akash missile, the Nag missile. Uh, I put up BrahMos there as an anti ship missile. But uh, out of the first IGMVP, uh, BrahMos, Nirbhay, and Astra, which is there somewhere, on, uh, one of them, they were not part of the original IGMVP. Uh, that was because of funds and the number of people who were around but uh, they were added on later on. The, uh, uh, oops, the Akash weapon system is uh, a multi-layered, you know, multi-target uh, system uh, to look after vulnerable points. Uh, it's in uh, service with the Indian Army and the Indian uh, Air Force uh, to look after their uh, uh, vulnerabilities, etc. Uh, we have uh, uh, Akash Prime, which has also got uh, orders from the Indian Army recently. This is in production by uh, a company in uh, Hyderabad called Bharat Dynamics Limited. It's a PSU. Uh, we are working on Akash next, next Generation, which would reduce the reaction time and give longer ranges. Uh, Astra, which is uh, an air beyond uh, visual range air-to-air -air missile, uh, ordered by the Indian Air Force now on, on the various platforms the Su-30, the Tejas, which is just uh, coming to service, but the Mirages, the MiGs, they all are capable of uh, the Astra. The orders, uh, they've been in, it's been in production with the BDL since 2017. We're working on a, a Mark II and a Mark III of Akash, I'm uh, sorry, Astra, which will make a, a longer range and uh, uh, less vulnerable to electronic countermeasures, uh, uh, etc. Now, uh, I haven't kept it in order, which is very rare on my part, but anyway. Uh, now, I told you all these things, but I'm going to tell you a little uh, story about uh, 
the Operation Desert Storm. All of us have heard of it. 1991, the Americans uh, hit out at uh, Iraq. Uh, more than 1,500 missiles, Tomahawk cruise missiles were used. And uh, since, uh, till 2003, about 1,600 of them have been used. After its debut in the 1981 war, uh, the Tomahawk missile has been underlined as the instrument of US execution of uh, foreign policy. Uh, in the 91 war, what they used with the Tomahawks was, it was, it was a surprise. <clears throat> they took out all the hard targets, that is their uh, surface-to-air missile stations, their control centers, and including the uh, presidential palace. <coughs> but uh, since then, in the last 25 years, Bosnia, Operation Deliberate Force, Libya, Operation Odyssey Dawn, uh, and also the initial strikes recently on the Islamic State's de facto capital Raqqa in 2014. Tomahawk missiles were what we used. So it is understood that cruise missiles uh, are going to change the dimension of warfare and it is very successful in being used. The reason is because they fly low, they fly below the uh, radar horizon and they can creep in right up to the target at the last moment. The Iraq war saw the first use of not only cruise missiles but the stealth the F-114 of, of Lockheed Martin. So Lockheed Martin's aircraft would go way up without the radars actually seeing them and drop their bombs, while at the same time the uh, cruise missiles were underneath uh, knocking out uh, the hardened targets at the bottom. So uh, this actually spurred uh, DRDO on that we had the IGODP, but we have these few missing links the air-to-air -air warfare, which, which was Astra, which we talked about, the cruise missile uh, warfare. But uh, the technologies for uh, uh, the uh, cruise missile uh, development was uh, were not available with India directly. You have to understand that uh, we were, yes, at that time in the 1980s, we were still growing and learning about technology and we were, we were, and I, can say to a certain extent we are dependent on foreign technology for a few things. We'll come to that uh, exactly. But uh, what happened is uh, uh, Dr. Kalam uh, led a team to Russia uh, sometime in '93. Uh, what uh, we went to a company called NPO Machinist Trainer, from whom we were taking a little bit of consultancy on a various uh, various few things. And uh, there, you know, it was conceived that why not? Uh, the Indian scientists and the Russian scientists work together on creation of a missile together. Uh, what happened is, you know, it was, it was moving us away from the idea that India buys and Russia sells. This was a place where it was going to be, both will work together and develop together. Uh, there were a lot of discussions, I mean, it went on from uh, 93, went on up to 90, 98. When in 98, finally, February 12th, uh, uh, historic uh, intergovernment agreement was signed where the government of Russia and government of India together would put in money, create this company called Brahmos Aerospace to uh, make what is known as an anti-ship cruise missile, supersonic anti-ship cruise missile. Uh, it was an anti-ship cruise missile. So it was not flouting any of those, you know, uh, control regimes which we have been under. The missile technology control regime has kept us back for a very, very long time. Uh, so this uh, program was created so that we don't contravene, you know, Russia does not contravene the MTCR because India was on the wrong side of the MTCR in those days. Uh, but uh, what was very interesting about it is that this was created with very minimal investment from both the countries. It, was, it started with an authorized capital of $250 million only. Of course, anyone who say $250 million is a huge amount. But uh, I must tell you that all other projects which we had started at that time took much more money than this. But the idea was that we will make this missile, induct it into the forces, and sell it to the neighboring friendly countries, to third countries also. Brahmos has grown over the time since then. We have uh, a few work centers. In, uh, we are mainly based in Hyderabad as the main integration center. Nagpur, where we do our air version. Pilani, where we do repairs. Uh, we have uh, uh, a license cell in all many of the cities. Bombay also we have one because our industry partners.
Godrej and LNT produce out of this place. Uh, and we have a unit in Trivandrum, uh, which is much a little later on brought in. They do a lot of our subsystems. We are a very small organization of just 1,100 uh, people. Uh, it's, not, it's not very large. But that's because we are more of an integration uh, organization working on the design with our design partners. DRDO and NPO Machinist Training are our design partners. So uh, we are in the process right now of uh, creating a new version of Brahmos, the next generation, uh, which will be half the weight of what the current Brahmos is, uh, the same range as uh, air launch. But I'm, I'm looking, I'm going around right now with the begging bowl to these governments saying give me $300 million. And uh, my argument is only one thing, very simple. You gave me $250 million in 98. And in those 25 years, in fact, this is the 25th year of uh, Brahmos running right now. In those 25 years, we have established ourselves as a world leader, as, a, as, a, as the world's best missile. Give me another 250, we'll make another one, which is as good and would be more. And uh, now with an eye on uh, exports. Uh, what is Brahmos? Because of course everyone hears about it. We are a multi-platform missile capable of air launched, land launched, ship launched, and even underwater launch. We have done one test from underwater from a, from a submarine simulator. Uh, we are capable of hitting multiple targets, whether it be ships, whether it be land. This is how Brahmos has evolved from an anti-ship cruise missile to a land attack missile capable of being launched from any uh, any uh, type of launcher. We have different types of trajectories, short range, long range, high, low. The idea is to confuse and uh, make sure that the enemy does not know where we are or what we are doing. Uh, so much so that March 9th of this year, uh, there was a mishap by the Indian Air Force and uh, one of our articles landed in uh, uh, Pakistan. It did create some damage, but uh, everyone always says there was no damage. Uh, there was an accident. Uh, now they have placed the blame on uh, three officers of the Air Force not following SOPs, that's too bad. But uh, no one knew that where, that it had reached there. Only after it created its havoc, it was uh, found out that they are there. Uh, Navy were our first customers. That's a launch of Brahmos against a uh, uh, ship when we were having the warhead. Uh, very rarely do does anyone test a missile with the warhead. You only do tests without the warhead and just add the warhead on later and use it in war. But here we actually put a warhead. This was off Bombay, in fact. Uh, we sailed out from Mumbai uh, about 200 kilometers down. It was a big exercise. And what was left of the ship was, uh, you know, it was almost a Titanic, no rose and jack on the edge. But uh, <laughs> it was just water. There was nothing left. You know, when the, when the choppers reached there to do their dab uh, battle damage assessment, they found nothing there. Uh, yeah, but uh, the thing is, we are now on all frontline Indian naval ships, uh, currently about 21 of them, and most probably another 30 of them which are coming up in the future. We are capable of being launched in a vertical mode from a vertical launcher or an incline mode from uh, uh, INS Rajput was our first uh, ship we, uh, we installed on. Uh, I have myself sailed on INS Rajput for a cumulative time of about two and a half years. Because that was a, a ship on which we were doing our R&D on how does a missile fit, how do we do the alignment, how do the launch go. And, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Navy would take scientists only when it's fair weather. But we needed to know if there is, uh, there is bad weather, if the sea state is two or three, which is just when the white horses come up or the waves come up. And I wanted to even see cyclonic storms so that would the missile work in those uh, weathers also. So a few of us had to stay on board that ship to get to those weathers. Because they would not take us out just during that weather time. We have to be out when it happened. But we have done a lot of uh, work on this and uh, uh, the current ships uh, which have been uh, made even in India by Mazagon Docks Project 17 as we call it. Uh, we have just done a series of launches from them. In fact, we did a salvo launch. What we are capable of is doing a salvo launch. It's not just launch one missile, but there are eight missiles on board. We can launch all eight missiles with a gap of five seconds in between each of them. But when we did this, our missile is very expensive, so even tests are expensive. So we launched two missiles. Uh, one missile against one target and a second missile against a second target, and we hit both of them. 
uh, gap of launch between of them between the two of them was three seconds. <coughs> this is a classical the most launch from a land point. But uh, this is our next version from the anti ship. We move to the land attack where we do a steep dive onto a target. This is an island in the Andaman uh, and Nicobar uh, Islands. Uh, hit bang in the middle of the square where we were banging. That was without a warhead. But uh, this one is with a warhead. The much bigger thing. Uh, we, we had to keep using warhead trials because the users became more and more confident that these Brahmos guys are able to do whatever they feel like. We tell them do tell, tell them to do something impossible. They go ahead and show it, and it's possible. So we we have the users on our side now for uh, whatever trials we do. Uh, we started working on the air version. We have a uh, that's a launch. Actually, the missile is dropped from the Su-30. This is a gravity drop. Then the booster fires. I mean, that was a nose cap ejection, and uh, the booster fires. This was again against a, a ship in the sea, uh, 300 kilometers down. And of course, pinpoint onto the ship. We have already done. I mean, if you include the March 9th, uh, our development trials were about uh, 29 or 30, and then the users have done a lot of practices, and uh, the total practice launches they have done are about 70. So we have crossed the 100 mark of launches of Brahmos. And uh, uh, to tell you frankly, we have had only four failures till now. It's, it's, it's something absolutely uh, surprising for any type of missile that we have had. Every time we go to Brahmos alone, because we are only, you know, we are integrating and working with the users and uh, putting it up. But our designers have done a massive job. I was one of them at one time, but now I'm grown, so I can't say that. Uh, the Su-30 development was something very interesting because we had to modify the Su-30. Uh, the, uh, our missile is 2,500 kilograms, which goes up, and 2,500 kilograms is too huge a weight for uh, even the Su-30 to carry. So we carry it under the belly. We have to strengthen the airframe of the uh, aircraft and add it. Uh, today, there are a lot of foreign air forces asking us, we are buying the Su-30s, can you give us Brahmos along with the Su-30s? So we are in talk, let's, let's, uh, we, are, we are seeing a lot of interesting things happening. Uh, Brahmos is moving forward in, in many ways right now. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's been a long journey, uh, what Brahmos has been doing. <coughs> we uh, have made inroads as a corporate model, uh, a model which could be used by various other people in the future. We are looking at those things also by, for other developments. But what, what, what has made Brahmos actually work? It's a, long-term practical vision, uh, belief in innovation, and actually following concurrent engineering practices. We learn about it in theory, but uh, we actually use concurrent uh, engineering practices and that has led to the uh, success of this joint venture. I have to use the word Brahmos is a joint venture between the government of India and government of Russia. We have quite a few uh, uh, first in our uh, this thing, we are one of you know we are the first company Indian. We are uh, a company registered under the uh, Indian Companies Act, 1956, but that's been modified to 2016 now. Uh, we have a capital ratio of 50 and a half percent from the government of India and 49 and a half from uh, the government of Russia. That's how we turn out to be an Indian company. But because of this weird ratio, which is a very really rare thing. Uh, we are operated as a private company and not a public service unit. Uh, that has given us you know, a chance of being autonomous in our operations and moving forward very fast. The development of a missile from, the, from its conception, from its feasibility studies to the day of delivery, we delivered to the Indian uh, Navy in 2007, that's 98 to 2007, nine years from concept to delivery. It is, it's, it's a breakneck speed, it's, it's almost never done. And that to uh, a brand new missile. Uh, 25 years down the line, we are planning to do it once more. Uh, I have promised the government, along with my team, that we will be able to make this new missile, which will be air launched, uh, 1,500 kilograms, and we will be able to do the first trial by end of 2024 or beginning of 25. I would love to see it being done before 2024 so that I would be in service. But uh, so be it, everyone has to retire someday or the other, so it would be done by my successor, but that, that's uh, perfectly fine. Uh, 
<coughs> we are the first joint venture, we are the first missile and the only missile which as, as a TOTO has been given to the three armed forces. So uh, there is no missile in the world which is in employment, employed by the three forces of the uh, arm, arms. There is the Army, Navy and Air Force of the same missile. Is there either only with the Army or Army and Air Force or Air Force and Navy but not with all three. We, we are one of those uh, few things. Uh, we have established a brand name, uh, not only in India, but uh, it's uh, become a world name now. I must tell you, in 1999, when I went for an exhibition in uh, uh, one of the countries, there was one of the naval chiefs of uh, uh, one of the European countries. He comes and says, I would, you know, initially the European world was wondering, what is this item these people have created? Does it actually work? Then we had a few videos which we showed. And they were stunned because we were launching from 2001 onwards. And, uh, you know, they, they were in 1990, it was only a concept, but we were t showing them our simulated launches. He says, by God, if you have this sort of a missile, I want to be on the right side of it. I want to buy it. I don't want to be an enemy. But, uh, yeah, we, we've done a, a, a lot in that way. Uh, the world has been looking at us very carefully. Uh, as I keep telling people, the world is jealous of India and Russia. Of course, Russia has its own connotations in today's world. Uh, it's been a unique thing. There have been a lot of gains. But uh, the bigger gain which I would like to uh, talk about is that the industries, the Indian industries have gained. Uh, we were able to identify suitable industries to be associated with our development right from the beginning. This was the concurrent engineering I was talking about. Design and production at the same time. Uh, production of Mark 1 and Mark 2 at the same time by two different industries so that we can keep moving forward. Uh, we created this, I mean, it's now a buzzword, pri public-private industry partnership, uh, but we had this set in, in 98 itself. We had started this off and it has been used in the production of Brahmos. There are many small and small private industries who are our partners. They su support us directly, uh, uh, supplying us with items, or they become subcontractors to the larger uh, industries. We have uh, 20 major industries and about 200 small scale, medium scale industries who are our partners. I do not use the word vendors because Brahmos itself is an industry or a private in, a private company. So it is, you know. We have created what is known as the Brahmos Missile Industry Consortium. And it's one of the first of its kind in, uh, in, in the country. Uh, I mean, if you add up, though I said Brahmos is a small company, 1,100, our uh, human resources spread over all these companies who are working this is about 20,000. And uh, all of them are uh, contributing to the manufacturing of Brahmos. The joint venture has realized a world-class weapon. This is due to the shared visions of both the countries. We have used common culture. We have a strategic relationship with each other. We have harnessed the best of technologies of both the sides. That's why we were able to do things faster. Uh, scientific expertise have worked together. They have learned English and a lot of us have learned Russian. I wasn't too good at speaking Russian and learning Russian, so I married my Russian interpreter. <laughs> and that's how I managed it. But uh, uh, the main thing which I want to say is it's been a partnership of trust. Uh, I want to say why it is trust is today there are sanctions against Russia. Russia provides me about 30 to 40 percent of the missile in terms of uh, volume or in terms of uh, money from uh, them. Money is not being allowed to be given to Russia but they are still supplying us with the parts. This is the trust which is created. I, I am getting the parts for Brahmos uh, from Russia on a regular basis, on a, on a, on a bi-monthly basis from them, even though we have not paid them. This is the trust we have created between the two governments and the two companies who we are all working together. And this is what has actually made this, this model into a real success. And this is what we want to take forward. And this is one of the reasons why Maybe people may not agree that why should we be working with uh, a country who has invaded. But I talked about Operation Desert Storm, Operation Strike. Uh, what was that? Well, anyway. 
due to the high performance of Brahmos, we have a competitive edge in the market. Through Brahmos, we have proven that India can leapfrog, create cost-effective uh, advanced uh, systems, work with an advanced country. Now we are advanced, so work with the country together equally and through a joint effort, sharing expertise, create something. It's been a win-win for both sides. Uh, trust me, the Russians are also as happy as we are with this missile. <coughs> we started with the idea of mine to market. We reached the market. Uh, proud to say that we had our first uh, export order from the Philippines. In February of this year, we signed a contract with the Philippines uh, Department of National Defense. The Philippines Marines have decided to have a coastal battery defense of Brahmos. We're in the process of uh, doing this right now. Uh, in another two, uh, three years' time, we would have uh, uh, three batteries of Brahmos in the Philippines. I make a lot of uh, trips to the Philippines overnight because uh, some small, right now, you know, uh, three days back they had a cyclone. I, earlier days we used to worry about cyclones in our country, now I'm worried about cyclones in the Philippines. <laughs> but then uh, that, that's the way it happens. But what I want to say is that from mine to market now, we have gone mine to the world. And I must tell you, the world is waiting with bated breath to see what we do in the Philippines because now the Philippines export is not a job done by Brahmos. It has become a national importance project. If India is able to do it and break into the uh, world uh, arms market, we are waiting in line for so many others. Akash, Astra, our radars, uh, our uh, guns, they are all waiting for export. This is just the step or the foot in the door. And uh, I know that we are going to go forward. There, there are a lot of, there's only one way to go with the world and that is to go forward. Uh, the future, I have told you already that we are working on the NG. I hope to get money from the governments. If not the governments, I am going to go to the industry and tell them, let's all work together and we'll create the, the Brahmos Industry Consortium will do it. But these are concepts. The government has to agree that we can make a weapon. No one can make a weapon in this country unless you have the government nod. So that, that's there. Uh, all of you must have heard that hypersonics, everyone talks about hypersonics. It's one of the buzzwords of today. Brahmos is working in hypersonics. Uh, we have a center of excellence in uh, Indian Institute of Science uh, at Bangalore. Uh, we also have a, a branch of it, a branch of this uh, center of excellence in Russia also, in the uh, Moscow Aviation Institute. We are working on the hypersonics, but understand that Brahmos now is not is only giving support in terms of manpower. I'm giving young engineers. Uh, I hope maybe some of you would join. Let's see what, what happens in the next couple of years. Uh, but uh, uh, we, are, we are giving the young engineers as our uh, uh, investment into the hypersonics. DRDO and uh, NPO Machinist Rainy are my partners. Uh, they are working on the technology bricks. Once they are matured, we put them together and the integration will be done in Brahmos. Uh, we hope so. I mean, that it seems to be the best place to do it. And then uh, uh, we also, are, I mean, there are two versions we are looking at. The current promos can be up it, which is possible in the next seven to eight years. But that means, you know, doing a little bit of material changes to the current missile. Or go whole hog hypersonic the way the rest of the world is trying to go. I am using the word trying to go. We are only hearing that people have used. Russia has only just finished the report. They have done the tests. China has just done the glide vehicles coming in. Uh, the Americans are playing catch-up right now uh, because uh, there's still a doubt whether Max 6 to Max 7 is worth it or not. The, the cost would be so obsessively high, uh, it would be vulgar actually. So would it, be, would it be worth having a weapon of that type? Why not stay at Mach 5? If it stays at Mach 5, you're going to see Brahmos 2 in 7 years' time. Uh, since it's Technovanza, this is an add-on slide. Uh, just the, the, the different types of technologies which one should look forward for in, over the next 10-12 uh, years. Uh, there are many of them are buzzwords, many of them are actualities. Let me tell you, moment we say artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence has been in our world for years together. Uh, all of us as youngsters when we grew up, there was that thing on the, on the washing machine which said fuzzy logic. There's nothing but AI. But AI growing up into more uh, bigger things, that's what we are looking at. 
It's already being done in various areas, but that is going to be the world of the future. You had uh, the young lady addressing all of you a couple of years back. I forget her name now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, she, she, that, that, that's AI. I mean, that, that, that's, uh, that's the cutting edge of AI, but then that's on a societal mission. On the defense area, AI is a little more uh, uh, convoluted, quantum technologies. Uh, I like to say that even though uh, nanotechnology is a word, word of about 10 years back, but still we need to play catch up in nanomaterials, smart materials. A lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of areas which, which uh, we have to work on for the future. Uh, I just wanted to keep it up because it's, uh, I, don't, I don't want to be stuck with just uh, Brahmos. And uh, as usual, all of us who have worked with Dr. Kalam like to end with Dr. Kalam. He has taught us two main things. If you want to be successful, work hard, have a goal. But don't be scared of failure, work harder, you'll get over those failures. And this is a fact. I, I, I've seen failures myself a number of times in the different areas where I've worked on, in Akash, in Agni, Brahmos itself, I think the flight number four, we failed. I was attributed as the main cause for that failure. But I'm standing in front of you in charge of Brahmos today. So work hard, nothing, nothing. failure is, you can always walk over. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, if anybody from the audience has any question, please feel free to ask. You know, this is where the out of syllabus questions start coming. <laughs> Uh, hello, uh, good evening sir. It's a pleasure to be interacting with you here. Sir, uh, the induction of Brahmos missile has uh, got India into an exclusive club of countries possessing uh, supersonic cruise missiles. But uh, why is it taking so long for us to uh, make a hypersonic missile like China or Russia? Uh, what are the challenges we are facing? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I'll rephrase your question. Uh, China and Russia, do they have a hypersonic missile? It's only what the newspapers tell us. They have tested. They have tested. We have also tested. And uh, when Russia says they have tested a hypersonic missile, uh, do a little bit of reading. Zircon, they have tested from their ship, one of their ships. Uh, the uh, Who is attributed as the manufacturer of Zircon? Uh, a group called the Tactical Missile Group. Go a little further in and check out which is the lab which has worked on it. The lab's name is NPO Machine Australia. That's Brahmos. Part of Brahmos. So, uh, 50% of the uh, China has worked mainly on the glide vehicles. So, that's the balance. I mean, they're not truly hypersonic. Every ballistic missile is hypersonic. Uh, the Agni comes in at Mach 6, Mach 7. But uh, it's unguided. So, what China has done is they brought in a glide vehicle, done a little bit of control. And they say that they are hypersonic. Getting it into actual service will take us seven to eight years. Any country. Uh, Zircon may get fast tracked because of the uh, work or the things which are going on right now in uh, the geopolitical situation. But it needs money. Uh, is it worth spending money on hypersonics or do we make more schools and colleges? You know, this, this societal requirement of science and technology supporting them or defending them is there. Uh, I, I myself have a conundrum. I am able, I have an order, I mean somewhere on one of the slides, I didn't talk about it because everyone doesn't like to say it. I have an order book of about six billion dollars. That means I have uh, another six years or seven years of Brahmos making only this particular missile. If I bring in the hypersonic missile, they'll say I don't want these. I want only hypersonics. But how many will they be able to afford? five or six or ten, and the cost would be high, but it would not be six billion, it would come down to two billion. So as a businessman, I will prefer hypersonic six, a little more time, let me finish selling this, and then let the new thing come out. But uh, yeah, these challenges of hypersonics, I think uh, anyone can uh, read up anywhere. It is mainly materials, which can manage the uh, high temperatures, how to uh, get rid of the heat of uh, the flow which is coming in, uh, the lightness, the weight, which, which is required. It's now no more classical missile design. 
that you have an engine and you're creating an airframe. Now your airframe is the engine. The airframe, uh, and Brahmos is a very, very interesting example. I didn't go into the uh, structure of Brahmos. I normally don't do that in public lectures. Uh, but Brahmos is very close to the uh, engine is the airframe. In fact, Brahmos is an engine which flies. The rest of it is the items which are the, the warhead and the control system is all inside that engine. So uh, this concept takes little time to develop. Uh, main thing is finances. That, but it will come. Hypersonics has to come. Uh, like I was telling you, nanotechnology has taken so many years. It's nowhere around. Hypersonics is a buzzword like that. Quantum communication is a buzzword. All of us talk about it. All of us uh, hear about it. I worked on quantum key distribution uh, quite a bit. We were able to send a quantum pair of electrons between about 100 kilometers, but we just about managed. So if we just about managed with the best of type of sensors, getting into actual QKD and quantum communication may take another five, six years, when, because things you have to make it affordable for everyone. Hypersonic technology is it's a technology, but we not, may not be able to afford it yet. It will come, but it will take more time. Uh, sir, I have one more question. So we have seen the integration of uh, Astra missile, which is the uh, BVR air to air missile on uh, Tejas. We have seen it on Mirage as well as SU-30 MKI. But uh, we haven't yet seen that on uh, Rafael. So why is it so? Like, uh, is we it have only, I think, 14 Rafales in the country right now. The order is huge. That's right. But uh, only 14 have come. Let the, all the aircrafts come. You see, to do any work, uh, R&D work on an aircraft, uh, they have to literally, uh, why aircraft? Even the ship which I was talking, INS Rajput. Uh, they have to give us that aircraft for some time. Su-30 was with Brahmos for about uh, two and a half years. One Su-30. That means they say that they need 28 or 48 aircraft. I'm to, you take out one just for putting Astra on. They'll say, then what? I want, I want the 49th aircraft. I don't think it's worth it. Once all of them come and they say that yes, I have one extra for R&D, then we would do that. But it's not a, not a problem. It's NATO standard. Our launcher for Astra is a NATO standard launcher. It will work. I am worried about my Brahmos NG, which I am doing for the aircraft. Will I be able to make it NATO standard or not? Because the configuration is a bit difficult. But if you follow standards, you see, this is one thing which I am sure many people will be telling you. International standards, we may say that we can do Jugaad and get over and get things done. But finally, we need to follow international standards. Without standards, following those standards, we will never be able to integrate into the world. That is uh, really the fact. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? In fact, when I was talking about INS Rajput, before, by the time the mic reaches there, uh, INS Rajput got decommissioned uh, last year. And uh, I, we Brahmos bid for, you know, they, they sell the ship to these shipbreakers. Uh, I, I told them, please, uh, give me the launchers which we have put on it. I mean, you bought it. So we will pay money back to the Navy and give me those launches. I want to keep them outside my offices. You know what happened is uh, we did a launch from uh, Andaman Nicobar Islands for uh, uh, we were doing a development launch for looking at the longer range of Brahmos. They offered INS Rajput as our target. <laughs> I said, cancel, cancel. This, this happened in February. The launch was cancelled and then everyone said, why, what happened? Are you not ready? I said, not INS Rajput. INS Rajput I cannot hit. You give me any other ship. Because INS Rajput is a Brahmos ship. <laughs> you can't do that. So, uh, they had to find some other ship, uh, scurry it into a target, and we used the other ship as a target. Yeah, go ahead. So as you mentioned that finances are important, and uh, as the different sector is expanding, uh, do you see the need of private equity firms in the near future? Oh, yes. Brahmos is a private firm. Maybe with the money from the government, but I am uh, now, as I said, I am going to be looking at uh, 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 infusion of equity from uh, my partners. The uh, uh, private industries have to get together and become a consortium. They have to work together. But we have to remember one small thing. Every company who works with each other are trying to make a profit. The moment each company tries to make their own profit, the final product is also very expensive. So we need to, you know, come to a uh, uh, an understanding that. We are looking for a product which is this cost. We are sharing the work between all of us. And this is the amount which you can, uh, which we can take as a profit. Currently, Brahmos, 
it may sound a very expensive, I can't give you the number, but it sounds like a very expensive missile, but to tell you frankly, we are working on a very wafer thin margin of profit. Defense is not a profitable industry unless you start exporting. So unless the exports start, the private industry also may not be interested in going into defense. But now we are seeing with the different policies, is it, it actually depends on the government policies. The policies are in right place, and now the private industry is geared up. Uh, the uh, Tatas and uh, uh, Kalyani group, they have done the gun on their own. Uh, there are a lot of people now working on their own. Uh, the Adanis are working on uh, uh, some of the aerospace parts. And I, I, uh, I hope one day we will all be able to talk about uh, the various uh, movements between various companies. The uh, Tatas are working on uh, uh, some of the vehicles for the defense on their own without taking any money from the uh, government. The what they call the make two policy of the defense acquisition procedure. This has actually pushed that now no more. And in fact, DRDO went out and uh, uh, published a list of 110 items saying that DRDO is not going to do R&D and uh, any more work in these areas. This is for the industry to do. Drones. Drones now, DRDO says we are not working on small drones. We are looking at the uh, higher uh, again, stratospheric uh, type of drones. But the smaller drones is left to the private industry. Private industry has to gear up. But as I said, standardization, following standards, quality control is uh, the biggest pitfall which we will have. Uh, Brahmos has been successful because we did not allow the industries to do their own uh, QC and Q, uh, QR. That was supported by the uh, Missile uh, System Quality Assurance Agency of the Government of India. They did the uh, quality assurance at each one of these industries. This is one place where we will need to pull up our socks. It's going on. Uh, the uh, ordnance factories have been privatized. So I would expect to see a lot of interesting and uh, nice things happening there. Uh, the private industry is in, and they 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 have they're in for a winding road. I I mean, Brahmos has spent 25 years, and we have shown that a private industry is capable of getting orders and getting things done uh, properly. So I'm sure they're all coming on board now. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Uh, I have a personal question to you. Uh, how does one de develop interest in missiles? Uh, aviation and pilot seems a bit practical and logical. How did you develop your interest in missiles? Okay, uh, let me talk about myself first. Then we'll. Uh, I wanted to join the armed forces. Who doesn't want to don a uniform and uh, fight for the country? I, I'm sure a lot of us would. But, Chashma. Uh, <laughs> Didn't allow me to. <laughs> so, uh, uh, next best was uh, to uh, do engineering and work in the R&D area. But uh, the secret is, I told you, my father uh, was an engineer. Um, he joined Dr. Vikram Sarabhai way back in 61 uh, to work on the Indian space research. So, I grew up uh, in the laps of uh, many of these doyens of Indian rocketry. I mean, Dr. Sarabhai, Dr. Brahm Prakash, Satish Dhawan, Dr. Kawarikar, these are all my uncles. So I would say that R&D has been in my blood since then. And that's how my interest is. But uh, for others, it's simple. If you're a good chemical engineer, start looking at uh, getting into propulsion. If you're a good mechanical engineer, you have everything. Because uh, even whatever machines the electronics guys use, you only have to create the machine. But then, of course, when the mechanical engineers want precision, they say that you electronics guys have to control me well. Uh, this, uh, the five axis uh, winding machines, you know, uh, the controllers are after all what? That's electronics and electrical. So you can live without each other. Please understand that. A missile is a beautiful synergy of all, all uh, realms of just not just engineering and science. Mathematics is massive there. Uh, interest is start reading. Uh, go into the history of rocketry. I, 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 I just introduced you to the history of rocketry because there are a lot of interesting stories out there to, uh, I mean, if you look at the different words which you saw there or different names you saw there, if you start reading their stories, it's unbelievable. There are really a lot, lot of interesting uh, uh, things. And when you start reading that, how, how does my Diwali Pataka go up? If you start with that, every child who knows that I just have to put the light here, it goes up. But why does it go up? 
that is only a person of physics and science who knows him. I, 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 you know, engineering is applied science. If you, people might argue, but I use the word that engineering is nothing but applied science applied with logic. Science on its own is not logical. Engineering has made science logical. I don't know how many computer science people are here, but if they're around, computer is still reaching the engineering area, it's computer science. Nowadays, we are calling it computer science engineering, but nothing to worry. Uh, I'm a piano player myself, piano in the sense, uh, a software guy myself. So, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's the, uh, work in the area, if you do a project, then you will get more interest. Join DRDO, and if you get to get into the missile complex, there's nothing like it, but there are very few jobs. Well, idea is uh, at the student level itself, so start working in uh, uh, these sort of projects, and yes, you will be able to do it. All the best. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, although BrahMos is the fastest and the most deadliest cruise missile system in the world, one of our adversaries, China, they are rapidly advancing their air defense systems and electronic warfare systems. They are also importing from Russia uh, new air defense systems like the S-400 and maybe in the future the S-500. So I wanted to ask you, uh, in the event of a conflict, can the BrahMos effectively penetrate those air defense systems? Yeah, yeah. I have no doubt about it. Uh, I have no doubt about it. Uh, I, I, <laughs> yeah. Everybody say, yeah, this is this is usual uh, uh, this thing. But uh, I, let me tell you, uh, I, I was never allowed to do something which my uh, you know normally at, as I said in Brahmos we we say we would like to do and people said go ahead and do. But there was one thing which my boss, uh, my immediate boss, those days I was still working as a DRDO person for Brahmos. I said. Sir, let me launch this missile and let's put on all our air defense radars, all on the ships and as well as on the shore. Let's put on all of them and I want to know how well are we tracked. I was not allowed to. I was not allowed to because of two reasons. There are two, there, there are two flip sides to the coin, you know. If we are tracked, then you are not good. But if you are not tracked, that means your air defense is not good. <laughs> 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 so, you can't do that test. Uh, but, uh, I have done the test and I can tell you that uh, uh, S-400 I still need to evaluate because uh, we have not seen the S-400 yet. Uh, S-300 which we are getting, I will be able to evaluate against that. Uh, the uh, uh, modern systems which uh, Pakistan has from China, uh, they couldn't uh, see us. And I will tell you the secret, a uh, very simple thing, INS Rajput, we had an incline launcher, we launched from it, the, uh, their surface-to-air missile system was on, it's of Russian origin in fact, and he had a nice proper rear view of our missile taking off, he tracked us for only about 5 seconds and lost us, because our RCS is so small, our, our RCS is uh, below 0.9 uh, meter square at uh, almost all the frequencies. So we are almost invisible on a radar the moment we hit uh, supersonic, the moment we hit 2 Mac, uh, we disappear from all radar screens. I have seen it myself, I sat with um, some air defense radars in uh, in Pokhran, we have sat and when a launch was done, I sat at some of our air defense radars and I said, damn it, if you guys are going to be attacked by a missile like this, you are never going to be there. You only look for helicopters and aircraft, don't look for missiles. <laughs> but it's, a, it's a fact, uh, Brahmos will be able to beat right now, almost. There, there, are, there is a wonderful study done by uh, the, one of the American, uh, I will have to really think about it, but if you look out there, there was a study done where they said one ship of Indian uh, Navy with 16 <laughs> missiles to protect, if there was a war between the India and US, let's not look at China and Russia, these are very dangerous people to talk about with war, <laughs> they might actually do it, <laughs> but uh, uh, to defend against one ship, one Indian naval ship with 16 missiles, they need a fleet of about uh, 12, uh, 12 ships uh, to be able to take down this particular uh, frigate. So, uh, that I think speaks volumes. Technology, you know, is always one thing you play catch up. We are there, so there are people trying to look at us and shoot us down. The moment they reach there, that's what hypersonics is going to be the next step. Uh, people are already talking that I'll be able to track hypersonics. Hypersonics has another problem actually. In fact, when we were talking about hypersonics, hypersonics means heat. Heat means IR. 
IR, you just put it out in the space and see anything which is moving fast with IR, and then there you can see your hypersonic missile. And from far off, you would, you would be able to track with that uh, thing. So there are, you know, every plus point has a negative point. Right now, Brahmos doesn't have uh, an opposition. That I am 100% sure as of now. <laughs> if S400 works, too bad, we'll make China our friends then. <laughs> but uh, uh, be assured, Brahmos is able to penetrate right into the center of China or maybe even beyond. With Brahmos on the uh, Su-30, uh, no part of uh, almost any world is uh, uh, free from us. We can reach anywhere now. Yeah. So, I have this one question. Uh, every time there is a conflict uh, involving Russia, like the Crimean crisis or the one that's happening right now, the Ukrainian part, the Indian government is supposed is forced to walk on a tightrope of diplomacy. So, I'm just curious to know how uh, your partnership with Russia affects with this what, whatever conflicts which happen in Russia. Yeah, um, uh, you know, we have to look at this is a geopolitical issue. Please don't, please don't, because. Uh, I'm not going to allow you to ask another question. It will be most, uh, most dangerous. You're taking it into a political area. <laughs> <laughs> That's my thing, sir. <laughs> anyway, uh, the thing is, uh, you see, uh, number one, a geopolitical arena is something which science and technology cannot handle. That we have to leave that to the experts who are in that you know, foreign affairs thing. But India cannot shake the shackles of being with Russia. We are right now dependent on Russia for so many of our things. Not just, well, leave aside Brahmos. Brahmos uh, is going to stay forever and ever because the Russians need uh, Brahmos aerospace in India. Uh, because of parts, uh, whatever missiles are being made there, they take parts from us also and money is always involved. But uh, uh, all our weapons are of Russian origin right now, so till we are able to break that shackle, we will always be aligned with Russia. Aligned in a sense, not aligned with their policies and philosophies, but we will not allow them to be uh, gone against unnecessarily. They have done nothing wrong. If they have done nothing wrong, then why should we uh, place sanctions against them? This is the uh, line which the political, uh, geopolitical part of it is taking. I do not know whether uh, if we take an opposing line to Russia, whether there would be a problem because this blow hot, blow cold of uh, uh, India with any nation has always been there. We have uh, shown tremendous camaraderie with uh, a country and then after a couple of years, it's the other way around. In fact, this is the worry which we are having when we are selling Brahmos to uh, the Philippines. Even now I am being asked, Suppose our Indian ship goes to the South Philippines, uh, sorry, West Philippine Sea, which is also known as the South China Sea. I don't call it the South China Sea, I call it the West Philippine Sea. Uh, sorry, East Philippine Sea. If an Indian ship goes to there, how do you know that the Brahmos will, your Brahmos, which you have sold the Philippines, will not hit our ship? I said, don't never become uh, enemies with Philippines again. <laughs> There's no other way out. So, uh, friendship or towing a line in the United Nations and all that is not for us to talk about. Let, let the geopolitical people talk about. But as an industry, we are not affected. That is because of the trust, as I was telling you, the trust which has been created between the two working partners. Nationwise, I don't know. But the day someone tells me, break free of Russia, I will say, close down this JV and no more Brahmos. It's a fact. I've been asked this question and I've told that if you want a joint venture, we will indigenize, we will start making the Brahmos here, but forget about the future. We have, I mean, now, now let's, let's take a balance. If you say, oh, I should not look at them again, so be it. But then we will work on the future and instead of uh, 9 years or 10 years, we will take 25 or 30 years. So, uh, is it worth it? I don't know. Uh, is it worth uh, to, uh, not towing the line or uh, going this side? I wouldn't know. I spent a lot of time, three years, in with the sitting with the foreign affairs people. I was part of the embassy of uh, India in Moscow, albeit for a different reason. But uh, the our external affairs people are 
queued up well enough to decide on which way we should go. The government also, uh, when I say government, it's not, and when I say political, it's not that it's the political masters which we have voted for. It's the, it's the government of India in total, that is the legislation, executive and judicial together. I, I'm looking, I look at it always that way. Never mistake when, I, when a person like me says political, I'm looking at it as a total, not as, uh, not as uh, just a, a political party in the way we talk about in India. Please take that as a as thing. Thank you. But it's a good question, which, why? Because it's better to be neutral. Now, being non-aligned is always the best. Being part of uh, 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 a party or a, a, a group, I don't think is really worth it. It's always better to talk about uh, we, <coughs> the Agnis, the Prithvis. I don't think we are ever going to use them in war because they are stat uh, strategic weapons. They are deterrents. Brahmos is walking the thin line between strategic and tactical. But since we are not nuclear, which is a uh, a purposeful tact done by us that it will never go nuclear because if it becomes nuclear, it becomes strategic, it will never be used. But now it's a potent weapon which will be used in the next conflict, armed conflict which our country has. There's no doubt about it. I don't like the idea that we will have one because uh, one shouldn't go into war. One should be able to muscle your way through different ways. Covid, for example. <laughs> Or there are different ways, but uh, that, that's a different area altogether. <coughs> yeah. Experience in the sense, uh, in terms of, uh, are you are you trying to plot, uh, ask about in terms of spying or in terms of yes, working? Yes. Like the film, uh, Rocket to show with the. Oh, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> uh, I do not know if you people have uh, heard. Uh, uh, I think it was four years back. Uh, a Brahmo scientist was arrested. He's still in jail. Uh, we have the IP people uh, uh, on our backs for our Trivandrum facility. Our Trivandrum facility is saying that Trivandrum has become a hotbed, or Kerala has become a hotbed of uh, ISIS activities. So Trivandrum, your uh, uh, establishment is under, can be under attack at any moment. These are all, uh, I mean, nothing can be ever proven. Nothing can ever be said whether it happens or doesn't happen. Uh, I have walked side by side. I, I must tell you, because since you asked the question, I have to tell you, being in charge of international cooperation of DRDO, I have walked side by side with the CIA guys and the uh, FSB, as they are known as the old KGB. Uh, they know inside out of what I was, where I am from, where I was born, who is this and who is that. Absolutely. But there is nothing to be scared of. I, I am telling you, if you are working for inner technology, and you know, you see, this, this is what, what I call a maturity of a person. If you know that this is the work I'm doing and this work I cannot talk to anyone else, I don't talk. I, I must tell you, uh, uh, my aunt and good friend is sitting here with me. She still doesn't know what I do. She only hears that I is in Brahmos, he is working there. She says, you don't, uh, you don't pick up my phone. Sorry, I don't pick up the phone. <laughs> no, I don't answer the phone. I mean, this is a fact. My, uh, my, my kid, he's, uh, he's doing his PhD, he says, uh, Papa, will I ever get to see a launch of uh, Brahmos from the air? I mean, uh, this was much very long ago when he was a younger boy. And I said, uh, Aditya, we will be doing it, but I won't allow you to see it. That, that's not possible. But when, when, when will it be? I don't know. When the actual launches took place uh, two years back or three years back, uh, he actually messaged me and says, Oh, you did it just now. At that time, you were bluffing to me. Well, <laughs> but the idea is that uh, uh, we have to be aware all the time. In fact, uh, 
Uh, I am standing here right now in front of you without a phone on me. They are down there with the uh, power. We have this habit of actually leaving our phones at different places. That's one of the reasons why she says, I know you have got the message, but I know you uh, you are not reading my message. It's a fact. We don't. We are not on. Uh, I mean, we are not supposed to be on uh, all these uh, social media things. But it's impossible. Uh, we are ourselves being uh, policed by our own intelligence people. So they are there in the first place to actually uh, warn you that hang on, there's something happening. Uh, we may hear more things like this. Uh, the honey traps, money, everyone has a price. It's only what is the price. <laughs> that, that, that's what you have to be careful about. That, that's all. Yeah. Thank you. All the best, everyone. Thank you, sir. Stay safe, please. Uh, staying safe is more important right now than even thinking of other things. All the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We are honored by your presence today. It was indeed a thought-provoking session and we are glad to be a part of it. Also, thank you to our wonderful audience for joining us today. We hope you all enjoyed this session. I am Shweta Sonavne signing off and until next time, this is Technovanza VJDI.